So we're continuing um, our series in the book of Nehemiah. And so if you have your Bibles, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2. And we're continuing this series in the book of Nehemiah. I believe Nehemiah speaks to so many of us. And today I want to talk to a lot of leadership when it comes to the book of Nehemiah uh, today. Um, so Nehemiah chapter 2. Here's, here's what I've learned um, as we jump into this today, that we're in one of kind of three places in our lives, right? So there's three different seasons, I believe. There's a season of receiving. Receiving, right? So you're receiving something and really you're receiving something that's going to pour into your gift, right? Then there's the season of maintenance, not maintaining, but maintenance where you are agitating ground, you're tilling ground, you're working to build something for your gift. And that's the longest season. I think often we see maintenance and maintaining as the same, but maintenance, I'm maintaining, I'm pulling up weeds, I'm removing that which doesn't help my stuff grow. I'm maintenance, I'm, main, I'm, main, I'm taking care of the stuff I have. And then lastly, there's this season of giving where because of the overflow from my maintenance season, I've been able to then give generously unto others. And Nehemiah's book to me, the beginning of this book, we'll get to the end part later. We're going to walk through this book. But the end of this part of Nehemiah's book shows us that after he had been given impartation from God, he received something from God, the hand of the Lord is good upon me. Nehemiah, we see him wrestle with this whole maintenance, right? What it means to maintain, what it means to wrestle with, to agitate, to destroy destroy, to build, to plant, all of those different types of things. And so last week we talked about how Nehemiah had to walk in his anointing, right? How Nehemiah understood the hand of God was good upon him, but he had to build his confidence and he followed through on what God challenged him to do by walking in his anointing, by going someplace at night to survey the wall, to wrestle with it. And then finally in verse number 17, he gets up and tells everybody, the hand of God is good upon me. And something that God had told him him, something that he went to the king with, something he went and surveyed the land with. Nehemiah finally has the confidence and the strength to stand up in front of all these people who the, he's now the third person to come and rebuild this wall. Nehemiah finally has the vigor to stand up and say, the hand of God is good upon me. It's a beautiful thing. And so now I want to build upon this today because if we're going to be people who follow through, if we're going to build the person that God's called us to be, if we're going to lean into the reality that God has showered on us with his grace and his mercy. And if we're going to be people who agree with the fact that God's hand is good upon us, then not only am I walking in my anointing, but this week I want to talk about how to work your access, how to work your access. So let's start. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 17, I want to walk through these couple of verses, and then I want to go to chapter 3, and you'll see hopefully where I'm trying to get to, what God kind of shared with me this week to share with you, and I pray it blesses you this, this morning. Let us pray before we jump into the Word of God. Father, speak to us. Open our eyes that we might see you. Open our ears that we might hear you and break our hearts as we continue to learn how to love you, and you show us how you broke Nehemiah's heart. You break ours for the people you've called us to serve, and even God, when it means to serve ourselves because of the cause you put inside of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 17. Look at the word of the Lord today, and we're going to just literally walk through these verses. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says this, Then I, Nehemiah, said to them, the people who were on the wall, surveyed the wall with him, Will you see the trouble we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. So come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. So I also told them about the gracious hand of my God who was on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Let me pause there really quickly. So remember to give you context of this. So Nehemiah had heard about this. He went to King Artaxerxes, right? And he, Artaxerxes, excuse me. He went to King Artaxerxes and told King Artaxerxes that God has called him to go rebuild the place where the, that lies in ruins for his ancestors. He didn't tell him where it was. Here's why. Because the last time somebody did this, King Arxerxes, he made sure that the work start, stopped. Arxerxes was so powerful, y'all, that if he wanted to, he could have killed Nehemiah if he really wanted to. But Nehemiah had worked his way up to be in such a great place with King Arxerxes that if he even heard that Jerusalem was being rebuilt, he didn't send anyone to kill him. So now the people heard Arxerxes is on board with this thing. God is on board with this thing. That's awesome. So here's what we'll do. Let's start rebuilding. And look at the way that Nehemiah and even all the writers and redactors kept this word in the text in verse 18. So we began this good work, this grace filled work. Let me ask you a question. How do you describe the work that you do? 
right? How do you describe it? When you think about when you go to work on Sunday, on Monday to Tuesday, whenever you go to work, how do you describe your work? Are you going to do good work, wholesome work, patience-filled work, joy-filled work, or do you, I'm just going to do this work, I got to get it done, it's boring, it's lazy, I'm just trying to do, I'm doing C-level work, I'm trying to, how do you define the work you do? Because let me tell you, how you define a thing is how you'll do a thing, right? How you define a thing is how you'll do a thing. Nehemiah begin, gets on this wall, remember, the walls are still hot from burning fire, the walls have all been torn down, but Nehemiah looks at it with the hand of God, with the affirmation of the king, and says, we're going to do good work. Look at verse 19. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing? Are you, are you rebelling against the king? In verse 20, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you'll have no share in Jerusalem, his claim or historic right to it. Okay, so Nehemiah walked in his anointing, but this week Nehemiah works his access. Keep your Bibles open. I want to show you this stuff today, and I want you to make sure you underline and highlight some things too. So Nehemiah, remember, he shares with us all that God tells him to do. Not only did God open the door, but then God, uh, anyone who had questions, sees the king, Xerxes, affirm the task. Here's what I want you to understand about that. God has a peculiar way of giving us the affirmation of people on earth, so it opens the door to grow somebody else's faith in the process. Remember, this is the third time Time that somebody has come to rebuild this wall. Their faith in leadership, their faith in the community, their faith even in God, because remember, God has brought them out of exile. It's 50 years after exile. They're the third person, Nehemiah is the third person to come with this big vision of rebuilding the wall. But God used the king's voice to affirm on earth what God had already affirmed in heaven to build this wall. So my word to some of you is don't constantly seek out kings to affirm you, but rejoice when God uses people in positions of authority to affirm you, because it's an opportunity to grow the kingdom with people who are still growing their faith. And so we get to this text, and God has affirmed Nehemiah. He's affirmed him on earth. He's affirmed him in heaven. And then verse 19 often is a place to stop and preach a sermon, because it's a real good sermon, right? You, you're trying to do something. God's called you to do something. And verse 19 says, but you got some enemies. And oh, don't we love talking about enemies, right? And we just love talking about haters because everybody got haters. Don't nobody like nobody, right? But everybody love everybody. Here's what I want to challenge you with today because if, if your focus is too much on the petty and if your focus is too much on enemies, you're literally giving the wrong people power, right? That, that they're people either you're going to build something to counteract them or you're going to build something, uh, you're going to build something to in spite of them. You're not building something because God's hand is on you. Don't, don't miss me. That if you're so concentrated on pettiness and enemies, your building will be to counteract some people or in spite of people, really, who don't care. Too often we're building stuff to counteract people who don't care. You're doing stuff to counteract. You really put that status up hoping that that person saw it. You wore that outfit hoping that that person saw it. And your whole day is based upon how that one person looks at you and engages because you did all of that to hurt them and you forget that the only reason you're not dead yet to build this wall is because God's hand is on you. And the, the challenge we have is to build because of God's hands, not in spite of somebody who does not care. Because you are not what your enemies call you. You are not what your enemies assume you to be. You are because of God's hands. And notice it, because notice even how they got this. And I want you to see this. They heard about the work Nehemiah was doing. So they heard about it. Now, look at the text. Remember, this is the first time that Nehemiah gets up and says, hey, the hand of God is good upon us. Let's go build this. Because remember, he went at night. He gets back. He gets up in front of the people. So here's what got me. How in the world did Sanballat and Tobiah find out that quickly about the work Nehemiah was doing if this is the first time that Nehemiah is vocalizing the work that God called Nehemiah to do? And it shows me something in this text, that there was somebody in Jerusalem 
Jerusalem, who heard the vision from Nehemiah, heard the hand of God was good on Nehemiah, and rushed to tell Sanballat and Tobiah about how, the, how much they don't agree with the vision that came from God through Nehemiah. Let me tell you something. I would much rather have a vocal friend than a silent enemy. I'd much rather have a vocal enemy than a silent friend. I'd much rather have some enemies that talk about me than some friends that are trying to tell me that they're all for me. Meaning, there were some people in the camp who heard the vision, people in the camp who saw God's hand on them, people in the camp who saw Nehemiah's heart broken and ran and told their enemies that what God has called them to do. Now remember, the reason that's important is Samaria was a powerhouse. And with Jerusalem torn down, Samaria is going to be happy because some people only rejoice when things are torn down around you because that makes them feel good about their own insecurities. And Samaria was so happy because Jerusalem had been torn down. But my challenge is don't waste your time trying to find the people who are talking to your enemies, but spend your time building up the people who are building the wall with you. See, too often we waste too much time trying to find the source of gossip about you instead of celebrating the people who are building with you. I really hope you all hear me, that too often you waste too much time. I came to challenge you today trying to find folk who are gossiping and talking about you instead of celebrating the people who are waking up early and building walls and waking up early and praying for you and waking up early trying to intercede for you and God is challenging us quit tripping over the two people who are gossiping about you and celebrate the hundreds who's trying to build the wall with you. I wonder what your business would look like if you stop worrying about that one co-worker and just had the, had the guts to fire them instead of, instead of worrying about them and build up the ones who show up early to staff meeting, who email well, instead of worrying about that one friend in your crew who seems to always be negative. Build up the friends who are together praying for each other because either they'll expose themselves in the building or they'll, they'll get free labor out of them. But either way, remember, your goal is not to destroy anybody. Your goal is to build a wall to keep in the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, what? invest in the people who are investing in the building. Invest in the people who are investing in your business. Invest in the people who are investing in your ministry. Invest in the people who are investing in your family. Because notice, Sanballat and Tobiah can only have access to your actions if you give them access to your emotions. And so don't give them access to your emotions, which then will call actions to your access to your actions. And I came this morning for entrepreneurs and business leaders and people in the room. I'm coming against these panic attacks and these anxiety attacks and scrolling through everybody else's life and listening for gossip and calling the wrong folk back who have access to your emotions because I want to remind you God's hand is good upon you. I don't want you to miss that. God's hand is good upon you and don't give the wrong people access to your emotions that make you forget that God's hand is still good upon you and look what Nehemiah does. I love this. This is the only thing I want you to grab. I want you to highlight this. I want you to own this text. I want you to think about where God has you. Think about your family. Think about your business. Think about your church. All of that. Look how Nehemiah responds. Nehemiah gets up. He says, God's hand is good upon us. Sam Ballad and Tobiah hear about it. They come in. They want to take it away. And then look how Nehemiah responds to not just his enemies, but to everyone in the camp. He says, God will give us success. That's it. I, I want you to highlight that. I want you to own that scripture. God will give us success. The way he followed through in the maintenance of the gift and the calling and the impartation from God is that Nehemiah looked at his enemies. He looked at that community and said, God will give us success because I'm going to lean more into God's hands than the opposition around me. Because let me tell you, your enemy's voices never take away the declaration of God over you. Your enemy's voices do not take away the thoughts and the declarations that God has put over you. Your bank account will not take away the truth of God's declaration. Your student loans will not take away the truth of God's declaration. Your age will not take away the truth of God's declaration. Your insecurity will not take away the truth of God's declaration. Why? Because God's hand is good upon me. And so Nehemiah follows through. He says, God is going to give me success. So how does Nehemiah hold on to the success? Look at verse chapter 3. 
the end of chapter, verse 2 and then chapter 3, and this is it. He holds on to this declaration. Chapter 3 is the follow through on this declaration. Verse 20 says, the God of heaven will give us success. Somebody say us. Then he says, we. Somebody else say we. His servants will start rebuilding. That's the whole sermon. The God of heaven will give us, somebody say us, success. We, somebody else say we, will start rebuilding. That's the whole sermon. This 2.5, some believe is 4.5 miles long. This long wall was going to happen because of us and we. This wall that will be a protective mechanism for our community to keep our enemies out and to keep us safe within and to keep God's presence and glory inside Jerusalem will happen because of us and we. The way we'll keep our enemies out, the way we'll protect the promises of God, the way we'll engage in the presence of God will happen because of us and we. I want you to think about your family. It's not just because of you. It's us and we. I want you to think about your business, your church. It's us and we. This 52-day project that should have taken much longer happened in 52 days because of us and we. When you order get your business to sustainability, it's not going to happen because of how great you are. It's going to happen because of us and we. Even growing our own congregation, it's not going to happen because of one or two people. It'll happen because of us and we. And all of chapter 3 is how Nehemiah worked us and worked the we. I want to be very practical with you this morning. When you think about the places where God has called you, when you think about the gift that God has put inside of you, who is the us that's working with you? Or are you so, you know, talented and awesome that you don't need a us with you because you got it all together? Let me tell you something. You can't build that whole wall by yourself. You need a us and you need a we. Who's the us that's building with you? Who's the us that's assisting your growth? Who's the us that you're praying for? Who's the us that's praying for you? Who's the us that's pressing you beyond yourself but holding you up in the process? God is giving us success because we are servants. And all of chapter 3 speaks about the people who were not skilled, people who were not craftsmen and women, people who were priests and warriors and families who worked together to build a wall that should have taken them much longer in 52 days. You can build what God has called you to build. Yes, Jesus is empowering you. He's inside of you. But you can see here, even Jesus saw that I can't reach all of the area that I was I was living in, in and around my hometown of Bethlehem and Judea Judea and Nazareth. You know why? So Jesus said, I'm going to get 12 people, us. And then when I die low, I'm with all of y'all and y'all can go out and build the church of God. Because even Jesus recognized as powerful as I am, I still need to empower other people to do the work that's necessary to change the world. You can't do everything alone. You need a us and you need a we. And assistance doesn't mean you don't work. Assistance doesn't mean you stop working. If you are the Nehemiah in the room to all my leaders in the room, you need help. And if you're the people, because everybody's not Nehemiah, I don't want to get that twisted. Everybody in the room is not a leader. Some of us are people in Jerusalem who are building the wall. Let me tell you something. If you're a person of Israel in Jerusalem, help the Nehemiah. Everybody's not a CEO, CFO. Everybody don't want the weight of what it means to lead and hire and fire people. Nobody, everybody's not that. And everybody also isn't a janitor. Everybody's not a leader. Everybody's not a secretary. But let me tell you something. We all need to do the work together because without everybody taking apart, the wall won't be built because of Nehemiah. The wall will be built because us and the wall will be built because of we to every leader, to every entrepreneur, to every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ in this room, Nehemiah worked with them. It was us and it was we. It was us and it was we. It was us and it was we. Where in the world is God calling you to build and who are the people that are working with you? Here's the things I want you to notice about this text and I'll give you two next steps and we're done. First of all, the people who built this wall were not skilled craftsmen, not skilled craftswomen. They were average people. When you read throughout chapter three, I'm not going to read it because it's a long chapter, but you see throughout chapter three, there were priests that built the wall, there were warriors that built the wall, there were families that built the wall, they were just working men and women. Here's what's important about chapter three. This is important because the people who built the wall around Jerusalem were investing in Jerusalem and 
and they took part. They had a piece of this work. There's something different in doing something you care about and just doing something to do something. You can never force people to be invested. You earn people who are invested. But the challenge for those of you in the room who are leading people, hear this, busyness is not business. God, I really want to help you all today. Busyness is not business. And the reason that some of us are so busy is because you're too available. And the reason you're not accomplishing the one thing that God told you to accomplish is because you're too available because you're not willing to spread the work out to people who are invested in Jerusalem. The, re the reason people keep calling you is because they know that you'll do it. And sometimes you got to remember that no is a complete sentence. Never just do something to do something, but do something to change something. Never just do something just because to say you did it, but do something because you know that it's going to be tangible change. And these craftsmen and women, these average people, there were no, there were no smiths, there were no people who had casted stone and casted. There were people who just said, we really want to rebuild Jerusalem and we're going to do it with intention and purpose because this leader made sure he found people who were invested in the work. The second thing we see in this text is they built in proximity to two things in chapter three. First of all, they built in proximity to where they would serve, and then they built in proximity to where they lived. Why is that so important? So they built in proximity to where they serve. For example, verses one and two tell us that the priests built the part of the wall where sacrifices will be coming in, right? That, no ma that they built in a place that mattered most to their gift, which tells us not only do you need to work where you're gifted, but you have to spend time building the infrastructure necessary to protect where you're gifted. Here's my question to you this morning. How entrenched are you in building a base in the place where God has given you? How intense, not intentional, intense is your prayer life in the place you are gifted? Okay, so if you're singing in the choir here, how many praise and worship psalms have you memorized in the past month? That's an intense foundation. To all the ushers in the room, what hospitality scriptures in the book of Psalms and Proverbs have you memorized in the past month that if somebody asks you why you serve, you can come back at them, not just that I'm a watchman, but that God has given the one, I'm the one that God trusts with the, per with the place where God is going to be silent and his glory will be there. If you're a deacon, what leaders in scripture have you memorized and modeled your leadership afterwards? in the past month. You're in college? Cool. What transient people that were moving from place to place have you studied and memorized what their prayers were in the past month? That's setting a foundation. You're working with media? Great. What adoration psalms have you memorized in the past month? You're not just running sound and screens. You're doing something that's going to make sure somebody sees Jesus. To all you mothers in the room, what mothers have you studied and memorized their prayers over their children in the past month? What fathers, to the brothers in the room, to the fathers in the room, what fathers have you studied and memorized their prayers over their children in the past month? To all the kids in the room, you're not exempt from this either. What children have you studied? What babies have you studied? What proverbs have you memorized? And parents, what proverbs are you teaching your children so they don't grow up with other songs, but they grow up with wisdom? They spent time building the infrastructure to protect the gift where God had called them to be. What books are you reading? What scriptures are you memorizing? The things, let me tell you something, the things you're complaining about often are the very places where God has given you the greatest amount of vision. You're complaining about that at your job? That means you need to get up and go do it because the things you're complaining the most about are the places you have the greatest amount of vision and they were so invested in protecting the very places where God was going to use their gift. The last thing they did, they not only built where they served, but they built where they lived. And the text tells us they worked in areas in proximity to where they lived. They made a 2.5 or 4.5 mile long wall. It took no time. Here's why. Because people were bought into their peace because they knew that as strong as the wall was where they were, that was going to protect them from enemies that could attack their family. Let me see if I can put it this way. I, my wife got me for my birthday, which was last month. She got me my birthday, these custom-made Giannis Antetokounmpo shoes. And I love Milwaukee basketball. We got the best team. Y'all going to be terrible this year. So I'm just living into the reality that Milwaukee's probably going to win the first championship since we had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And so my wife got me some Giannis's. And these cool shoes are so cool. She got my old football number on it, number 77. She got the shoes made in my favorite colors in blue, gold, and off-white. And then she got on the inside of the tongue of my shoe, she put the name Cam. 
I should put my son's name on the inside of my shoe. That every time I put my shoe on, I see my son's name. And I'm walking, and everything I do, it reminds me everywhere I go, every time I look down, that I'm doing this, I'm living for this, so that my son knows what can look back and see what his father did. And I'm noticing something. Every time I pick up a book, my son picks up a book. When I pick up my phone, my son picks up his. He tries to find a tablet. If I'm watching TV, my son watches TV. If I'm reading my Bible, my son reads his Bible. Why? Because I have to protect what's inside of him him because I know that God is working on him even though I may not see it. And the challenge that we see in this text is they built the wall in proximity to where they live to protect their families and the future of their families. Because let me tell you something, legacy does not begin when you die. Legacy begins while you're still living. What are the seeds that you're planting the residue of God that you're leaving on your children that every step you take is blessed and your children are following behind blessed footsteps and not traumatic footsteps? Who's a person in your family that doesn't know Jesus that you're building the wall for? Who's the person in your family? Not, and I'm not talking friends or anything. Who's the person, that grandchild, that auntie, that uncle? You know that auntie or that uncle we make fun of at the family reunion that we stopped praying for a long time ago? And you wonder why in the world you can't save anybody else in your household, anybody in your job listens to you? You know why? Because God is challenging you. You're not done building the wall for that person to meet me. Who's the person that doesn't know Jesus that you're building for? They built where they served, and they built where they lived. And the last thing we saw, that Nehemiah was on the wall with them. Why? Because a life is better together. It's easier together. It's more fruitful together. So Nehemiah recognized, I cannot follow through on the success that God says we're going to have, so I need to work my access. Let me tell all of you, God has given you access to gifted people, people who need the Lord, people who desire the Lord, people who will only understand who God is when you go to them and deepen their ability to discern the movements of God around them. As we consider what it means to make disciples in the world, what it means to utilize our voices, our bodies, our gifts, our goals for the body of Christ, who has God given you access to that needs your voice in order to recognize they have the ability to build something that's bigger than them? And for those of you who aren't Nehemiah, who's the leader that God is calling you to support? Because that's where you, they're following behind you and that's where they are. Let me say this, access means you have people who see the vision, access means you have people who see the work, access means you have people who see the opportunity, they'll seize the opportunity, oh, everybody will do it, everybody starts working, but verse 5 of chapter 3, and I want to close here, verse 5 of chapter 3 says, and then with all of that, there were some folk in the camp who said, you know what, we're good, we don't want to work on this wall. Verse 5 says there's a whole community that stopped working. And let me give you this, what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah, y'all, he dissed discouragement. Let me pause there and challenge you. Anything that moves without any sort of tension needs to be abandoned. I want you to think about it. Imagine if you played Mario Kart, those of you who play video games, and you got on Mario Kart, and it was just a straight line with no problems on the road. Imagine a football game with no defense. I mean, that's it, right? Just imagine a football game. You watch it, and you're watching a football game, and you're watching your team run up the score because there's no defense. Imagine a basketball game with no defense, right? Imagine a car that didn't have to worry about being pulling anything in the car that you just weren't in. The car was just kind of moving. Anything that moves without some sort of tension needs to be abandoned. But here's my challenge to you. Don't search for conflict and tension and don't give emphasis to conflict and tension because the same way that Sanballat and Tobiah outside the camp didn't, didn't want to do the work, there were families in Israel who decided they didn't want to do the work. But remember this, God's hand is good upon you to complete the work. You, let me tell you, you will build things for people that can't stand you. You're going to share the gospel with some people, let me tell you, who are going to benefit from your story, listen to you, hear you cry, hear your testimony, and still hate you when you finish your story. I preach sermons in Providence, in Nashville, wherever the Lord has taken me. There have been times I preach sermons and I know folk hated me the entire way. And I've gone into communities and talked about black liberation with a whole bunch of folk that weren't black, and they hated every word you said. You're going to work with coworkers, and your boss is going to give you a project, and there's going to be some folk who just stop working. 
you know those school projects for all the folk in the room who have school projects still? You have school projects, you know there's three people who do the work, one person who thinks they're just too good to do the work, and then one person who just literally ghosts everybody until you get up on the presentation day and wants to get the group grade. But let me tell you something, do not change your output because someone else changes their involvement. Because remember, you were called to build the wall, Nehemiah. You were called to keep loving. You were called to keep sharing. You were called to keep preaching. You were called to keep teaching. And God is going to reward your faithfulness. Because remember, faithfulness is active and not passive. What would happen if you stopped giving so much energy and your prayer time and your email time and your texting time to the one family who stopped building and rejoiced? Watch the text in verse 6 through 10. Rejoiced over the people, watch it, who went and overcompensated to help build the wall because they saw the vision on your life and could care less about the people who said no because God just raised up the yes inside of them. Matthew chapter 25 gives us the story, and I want to give you these two scriptures. Matthew 25, faithfulness is active, it's not passive. In Matthew chapter 25, you get this story of the people, the parable of the tenth, right? And the master goes out to the, to the, to the servants, and he gives one servant one, he gives one servant one bag, one servant two bags, one servant five bags. And the text says that after he gave these servants all these bags, after a long time he came back and wanted to see what they did. And the one with five bags multiplied his stuff to ten, and we get the, the scripture, well done, good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a few things, but now coming up to the father's house, beautiful, right? We get the one with the two bags, he multiplies it to four. It's interesting to me, I just want to tell you, the one with two multiplies it to four, but he's still, his, 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 his harvest was still less than somebody else's seed, but the master still brought him to the same place because God is looking for faithful people. So he multiplies two to four. Well, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, now coming up to the father's house. And then he gets to that one servant who hid it in the ground and did absolutely Absolutely nothing with it. And the father calls him, you wicked and slothful servant. You, 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 you wicked and slothful servant. You wicked and lazy servant. Because let me tell you, faithfulness means multiplication. I want you to see me. We've gotten caught up in our Christian faith about faithfulness to God being lazy and passive and talking to God once a week. God is my band-aid. Jesus is my co-pilot. Faithfulness has become this passive thing where God blesses me and I hide it. You know how I know you hide it? Because you haven't brought your Bible to work yet. You know how I know you hide it? Because we're not talking about Jesus after we leave church. No, I know we're hiding. We're not, we're not, we're too ashamed to share statuses and share quotes from Christ on our social media. To know how I know we hide it, only 17% of people in our community read their Bible more than once a week. How I know we hide it, there are more people who believe in philosophy in our, in our community of providence, not the world, but our community of providence, than people who are actively reading their Bible. And what the text says, God is staring at us and saying, you wicked and slothful servants. Because faithfulness on to God is not passive, it's active. I'm constantly multiplying. I'm constantly looking for ways for my seeds to be multiplied because when I'm faithful to God, my prayers are active. I can't stop praying because he rewards those who are diligently seeking him. I'm still fasting because I can't stop fasting because I know that some miracles only happen by prayer and fasting. I'm actively loving somebody even if it's my enemy because if you hate me over here, somebody over here is going to hear the word over there and if you still can't and stand me. I'm a dust of dust. I'm a dust of stand off my feet and keep on moving because my faithfulness is not passive. My faithfulness is active. And God calls up the ones who are active. Nehemiah was on the wall. He dissed discouragement. He dug into details because he was active. So here's my questions, my challenges to you, to all of you. I had a lot of questions because it's more reflected today. Who are the people around you that God is calling you and compelling you to lead them? Nehemiah, get up because the hand of God is good upon you. Who are the people God has around you that God is calling you to follow people of Israel? Then get up and go build the wall. Who are the talented people that God is calling you to pull their gifts out? Then get up and pray together. Who are the people around you that God is calling you to have active relationships with? Then get up and invite them to coffee. You're not that busy. 
And why is that so important? John 14 and verse 12 says this, and I'm finished. John 14 and verse 12. If you haven't had this, I want you to pray this text. John 14 and verse number 12. Jesus having this one of his last conversations with his disciples. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Phil Thomas is freaking out. Philip is freaking out. And Jesus begins to tell them, I and the Father are one. They're still freaking out. Then verse 12, he says something so powerful. He says, very truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've already been doing. Paul. Us. What are the works that Jesus has been doing? Text. I'm glad you asked. He, he raised some folk from the dead. He healed some people. He opened blinded eyes. He destroyed systems and walls. He, he killed a whole oppressive regime. He destroyed people's insecurities and assumptions and prejudices. He touched the women of the community that nobody else wanted to touch. He healed the woman with, he healed the woman with the issue of blood by just getting close to him because the glory of God changed that inside of her. And Jesus says, if you believe in me because I'm working in you, you can can do all of that. How do I know it's true? Acts tells us that Peter healed people by just walking in his shadow. That God has the ability to ensure that just because we believe in him, we can do the work that he already did. But here's what blesses me in verse number 12. Jesus says, and then they will do, you will do even greater things than these. Oh, Jesus healed people by touching. Peter healed them by his shadow. When's the last time that God used you to be a miracle in somebody else's life? When's the last time that you were the participant in a miracle with the Lord Jesus Christ? Somebody say greater. greater. This is season that God shared with me a couple nights ago to impart over our congregation that God is challenging and stretching our faith and he wants people who are willing to have their faith stretched to walk into places where we can do even greater. Somebody else say greater. greater. Even greater things because he's going to the Father, leaving the Spirit in us to make himself known and manifested in the world. A couple of months ago, we were sitting here one night, Deacon Metz and I were here together, and everybody had left, and somebody had come in, asked us to pray over them, and we're looking at them like, cool, we can pray over you, it is what it is. I was tired, Deacon Metz was tired, we had a bunch of people to take home, it was a long day that we had, and this individual came in here, just asking, can, I, can you pray for us? Cool, yeah, we'll pray for you, ain't nothing, ain't no big thing, we'll pray for you. And y'all, we were in here for four hours, you know why? Because in the midst of that prayer time, this individual's whole body language shifted. As soon as everybody left, all of a sudden their body language shifted, their mind, their voice shifted. And however, we sat there and I looked at Deacon Metz in the eye and this person, we thought it was just regular prayer. We're going to pray for you. Get in your car. Go home. Y'all, after about 15 minutes of prayer, we're looking. Something is weird. Something is off in this room. I began to say, Lord, what is happening right now? Deacon Metz was over here reading scripture. We're trying to sit here like, okay, God. And we forgot that God said we'll do even greater things. And we recognize this person stood up as strong as they could. It was a big person too. They looked us dead in the eyes and they said, I am on assignment to destroy this church. And Deacon Metz and I looked at each other. We said, oh, some things only come by prayer and fasting. And Deacon Metz and I stayed in here until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock that night, destroying and deleting and removing the demon from inside that person. And you may think I sound crazy, but the text says that we'll do even greater things. That's the last time we saw a miracle in here. And it was so crazy. We were empty. We were tired. Deacon Days was outside wondering what in the world's happening. And Deacon Metz and I are here just screaming the name of Jesus, throwing oil all over the place. We were screaming the name of Jesus. Jesus. Why? Because I still believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. I wish y'all hear me. We were just screaming the name of Jesus because we still believe that God gives us access to the holy. And the only, and the scripture tells us that God says we'll do even greater things. And y'all, I want to be a church so bad that if somebody walks in here with stage three cancer because of the prayers of the righteous, they leave out and the doctor can call us and say that person got healed. I want to be such a bad church, y'all, that somebody walks in on a cane and leaves out without that cane, not because of hocus pocus, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be such a bad church, y'all, that people that walk in on the verge of divorce leave out of here ripping up divorce papers. I want to be such a bad church that folk walk in on the verge of suicide and leave out not just going to therapy, but with their minds renewed because they know whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things of good report. If I think on those things, I get the peace of God. I wish y'all that surpasses all 
understanding because I still believe in miracle signs and wonders. I still believe that God gives us access to his presence. I still believe that God can do exceedingly and abundantly. I wish I had a church in here. Above all you can ask, think, or imagine, I still believe that Jesus came and was born of a virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He died on a Friday night, but bright early on Sunday morning, he was resurrected. I still believe that on the 50 days later at Pentecost, the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit to go and impact the local church. I still believe that the Antichrist will come back into the world to separate the wheat from the tear. And I still believe that some glad morning, I wish I had a church, when this life is over, I'll be caught up in the sky to see my son and my father by himself. I still believe that I'll be able to worship him for eternity. And I wish I had somebody, I know it's eight o'clock in the morning, that still believes in this room that God can call you to do greater for your family, greater for your children, greater for your job, greater for your church, greater for your home, greater for your community. If you believe it, I dare you open up your mouth and give God a greater praise in this room. I know it's early, but I still believe he can do greater. I still believe he can do greater. I still believe he can do greater. And now unto him who can do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all, you can ever begin to ask, think, or imagine, according not to your power, but to the power he gave to us. To God be the glory for eternities to come. Father, we just agree right now with the greater you put over us. Father, we agree right now, God, with the greater you're calling us to. Father, we agree for greater in our homes and greater on our jobs and greater in our schools and greater on our bus lines and greater, God, even in our cars. We believe for greater in our elementary schools and middle schools and high schools. God, we believe for greater in our state house, God. We believe for greater in our nonprofits and for profits. We believe for greater in our hospitals, God. We believe for greater in our own congregation. And God, you told us that if we believe in you, we can do what you've already done. And so, Father, we declare over this house that we will see bodies healed. We will see minds healed. We will see radical increases in the incomes of your people because, God, every good and perfect gift comes right from you. And so, Father, we agree right now with six-figure incomes in this house. We agree with millionaires in this house, God. We agree with tenure in this house, God. We agree with increase. We agree with longevity. We agree with long life. Father, we agree right now in the... Y'all should be praying right now, too. We believe right now, God, in the name of Jesus, that you are still a God who can do exceedingly and abundantly. Above all, we ask, think, or imagine, we agree right now, God, that you will give increase. You will give change. You will give oil. And so, Father, we agree right now that you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, the everlasting Father. And, Father, we give all of this to you with the greatest praise we have because, God, we believe that you are God and God alone. So, Father, we set this at your feet and take the burden off our shoulders and give you glory even at 8.30 in the morning knowing that you are God and God alone. So God, honor your people this morning as they live into and build the walls for their families and their futures. And we give you glory like we've never given you glory before. In Jesus' name, I dare somebody take 15 seconds, open up your mouth 